she did. But my talk is not that much about biology, but about a couple of developments that we have had over the last few years, together with the Wu Lab at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, and it's a technology talk today. We're gonna introduce, I'm going to introduce a couple of methods that we developed uh, helping Tim Wu for visualizing. And now that this video is soon gonna finish uh, and you're gonna be paying attention to me, I can tell you that our uh, talk is about the structural determination on genomes and genomic domains. I normally say using restraints, but in this case by image tracing. It has two parts. The first part is uh, a method that we call uh, oligostorm, and the second part, the method that we call oligophysic. So the first time uh, talk is oligostorm. This was the work of Guy, Irene, and Cynthia. Guy from the Wu lab, Irene from our lab, and Cynthia from Erez Lieberman lab. Um, so this is about chromosome walking uh, using super resolution imaging. So what we're gonna try to do here is to look at, at the highest resolution possible, how a particular path of a part of a human chromosome looks like under the microscope. Everything that you will be seeing, the images are acquired at the wood lab, but then anything that means from the images to the three-dimensional models is done in our laboratory. Why we can do these things? Because the, the wood lab has been developing for many years, in, including many others, not just the wood lab, uh, Joyce, uh, Villiview, et cetera. They have been developing something that is called oligo, um, oligos basically, that are pieces of, of DNA that hybridize in specific sites. And these um, hybridize the specific sites of the genome because they have an homologous site, which is about 30, 40 base pairs that you design to go specific to a part. The part that we will look in in the next slides is, is uh, about eight megabases of chromosome 19 that we have divided the work. So we're gonna be trying to work the chromosome divided by what a priori the high C map is informing us looks like the compartment. So in this particular scenario, the design was by the compartments of the so-called AB compartments. You guys are familiar with that terms. So basically these oligos, they contain a, a main street and a back street. And these are pieces of the, of the oligo that then you can use to, if it has a secondary oligo, then when it goes, it actually blinks. And this is the blinking that the microscope uh, discovers and, and the microscope. What microscope we're using here? We're using a Butara microscope from Bruca. And this was acquired by Guy at the Harvard Medical School. So the, the, the design goes like follows. You first uh, denaturate a bit the sample, put all the oligos in, under the sample. And then step by step using fluidomics, you visualize the first part, the first segment that we call and collect the data. Then clean, release the second segment, secondary oligos, and then you get the signal and you do that until you go to, in this case, is nine steps and you collect the signal. Now, one of the things that are important when you do this type of experiments is to have an homogeneous, as best homogeneous distribution of these oligos across the region that you are interested to visualize. And they need to be of a certain size. You cannot do very tiny pieces. It's, uh, it's difficult to obtain enough signal in those tiny pieces. But in this case, because we wanted to see uh, segments, uh, these are the segments that we uh, visualize, one to nine, and you're gonna be seeing these colors across my presentation. And this is the distribution of the oligos in the design of this library. The, that we did uh, back in probably three, four years ago. That's, that's one at the Google app as well. But you can see that some regions may not contain oligos. These are pieces of DNA that are too repetitive to have a specific oligos designed for them. Some others have a higher density than others. But this is an important step that you have to be careful when doing these experiments to make this as homogeneous as possible across your sample. So then you put it under the microscope and you start collecting the blink and this is oligostorm. So you, you get this stochastic blinking of each one of the uh, oligos and each one of these points is one blinking. What you see here is again, the walk. Let me do it again. 
excuse me. So that you can see this is the segment number one, segment number two, segment number three. And this is actually how you acquire under the microscope. And each one of them has a large number of linkings. You see here, it's only one cell. And what you see here is the two homologous copies of chromosome 19. In this case, they were quite close in, in, in the space. So you have uh, one homologous here and the second homologous here. First message is that you really see quite a bit of structure, the difference between the two homologous pieces. And we, we talk a bit more later about that diversity of a structure or, or, or variability of a structure between the homologous. Now I just did a, a bit points might be more dense in here than here, but in fact, each blink has actually similar properties in, in here. This is for one cell. Then what we get from the WULAP are these blinkings, which come out from the microscope. And what uh, Irene did was, okay, we have a blinkings, a density of blinkings. Can we transform this into a density map, similar to what you would do under the cryo EM microscope when you look for complex of structures of proteins. And indeed, this is, is sort of trivial to do. This is again, uh, segment number one from one copy and the other copy of the two homologous chromosomes. And here is the maximum density that occupies the majority of the blinks. You can see that very few blinks are outside, but if you want to have the most dense part of the chromosome, that will be the most dense part of the blinkings that contains the most dense parts. And you can see here that actually you see quite a bit of a difference between the homologous, but at the same time, the density is not homogeneous within the segment. You have parts of the segment that are more dense and less dense. But the advantage of transforming these blinkings into density maps is that now we can actually get quite a bit of different numbers uh, from these uh, objects, such as the area, and these are all structural based uh, measures, such as the area of the segment, its volume, whether it's spherical or more elongated. We can actually calculate overlap. You can see quite a bit of overlap between segments in this region, quite a bit of little overlap or no overlap at all in this segment here. And then we can also calculate the distance between the segments by looking at the most dense part of this particular segment to the distance to the other segments, for example. And when you do this for the nine segments in a large number of cells, uh, in, in, in this case, we had 19 cells. It's not a very large number, it's a quite a number. These are images are very difficult to obtain or very cumbersome to obtain. Each one of them with two homologous were solved. You can see here the distribution of the data. And what you have is area, volume, and sphericity versus the segment. And what you have here is the distribution of the measure per segment. And I have shown here a couple of examples of each one of these very different distributions. In gray, what you have under the plot is the average for all the segments. And you can see that this is quite a variable measures of each one of these structural measures in here, both internally. So each one of the segments in different cells and in different copies have quite variability, but also between the segments. And this is the message of this plot that there is quite a bit of variability. Another thing that we can get, as I mentioned, is of this segment is we can met, uh, get the differential distance between the segments and the other segments. And this plot is very simple to plot, but quite difficult to understand or, or cumbersome to understand. What you have here in this <clears throat> plot here is versus segment number one. Would you expect to have a distance in a space that is proportional to the genomic distance between the two segments that we are visualizing here? We know the genomic distance between the two segments. So what is the distance? Is closer than expected? or farther than expected. So this plot basically says that segment number one is farther than expected, <clears throat> excuse me, farther than expected to segment three and four, but closer than expected to, for example, segment number nine. And you have the same for two, three, four, five, six, and you can start seeing a couple of, of regimes here, the ones that seem to be closer to each other in this group here, and farther from the rest, which are the extremes of the images that we are obtaining. The same measure can be obtained by differential overlap, whether they overlap more than expected by overlapping, meaning that they are on top of each other in the images, more than expected given the genomic distance. 
And you can see that one, for example, segment number one is as expected overlapping with the rest. But segment number two, it overlaps a bit less than expected with three, four, five, six, and so on and so forth. So again, you start seeing a couple of regimes here. So when we measure all of this, and we have all these measures, then we can uh, quantify or yes, quantify each one of the segments in its line here is one segment in 19 cells and two molecules. So in total is 342 segments that we have observed under the microscope. We can cluster them based on these different measures that I have mentioned to you, area, volume, density, propensity to be overlapping with other segments, et cetera, et cetera. And that uh, unsupervised clustering gave us two large clusters, although with large variability, these clusters are somehow very, um, um, somehow not very deterministic in a sense, but you can always get two clusters in an aggregate clustering. But you can see here, some of, some of these guys have quite high values in these measures and the other guys have high values in these measures. So these are two clusters we obtain by looking at the structural properties of each one of these segments. And how they are distributed, this is the principal component analysis of this matrix. And the principal component analysis number one is the one that divides the two clusters nicely. And we ask ourselves which segments are in cluster number one, which segments are in cluster number two. And what you see here is that the majority of the segments in cluster number one are three, four, five, six, uh, seven, and eight, seven, sorry. And the majority in cluster number one are one, two, and eight and nine. Of course, you can also have some of the other clusters being part of, some of the other segments being part of these clusters. In fact, if you look at the distribution per segment, class, uh, segment number one is 60% of the time has been classified in cluster one and about 40% of the time has been classified in cluster two by its structural properties. But uh, another extreme would be number four, segment number four, which is in the most of the time is classified as cluster number one. So here, the next question we had very clearly is because we designed this as a segment based on high C, is this really the segmentation, the separation, uh, so, sorry, compartments uh, in high C, is this really separating the two compartments, A and B compartments that we have known for high C um, for many years? And indeed, this is what happens. If you look now at uh, cluster number one and cluster number two, other properties rather than the structural properties that have been used to cluster them. So in cluster number one, we have high RNA expression. We have high, high dense DNAs, DNAs, higher 27 acetylation, high NK4 monomethylation and 3-methylation, and we have lower K27 3-methylation and K9 3-methylation, which basically resembles chromatin properties of A and B compartmentalization. If you now say, okay, I believe this is really A and B, and you color them by the cluster type A in red now and B in blue, you can see also a separation in the space of the segment. So, uh, one, two, eight, and nine would be mostly classified as B in the majority of the cells, but not in all the cells. And and one and two, with, and sorry, three to nine would be mostly classified in A, in this case, in the majority of cells, but not in all the cells, as you see here. So we really, really, the structural properties under the microscope are also resembling the segmentation uh, by compartments in high C. What are the structural properties? So the area for cluster number one, which now we call A, is higher area. It also has higher volume, but they tend to be less spherical, so more elongated. These are three properties that we uh, get from the images. The other two properties that we get from the images, remember, is the distance between the segments and the overlap between the segments. And you can see here something that you would expect clearly. Uh, a likes A and B likes B, but not necessarily find them each other in the space. They have a distance that is larger than expected. One thing that is new, sorry, from the work, one thing that is new from the work is this plot here. This plot basically tells us that A likes to intermingle with A. So it has a lot of intermingling and mixing of the 
blinkings of the points associated to each one of the segments, while B, even though they are closer to each other, they don't like to intermingle that much. So in AA compartments, we will have something like this. In BB compartments, we will have something like this. So this is an interesting observation that quite difficult to obtain from high C. The next thing that we did is because we do have the high C and we do have the, our method called TADB to build three-dimensional models based on the high C, we built thousands of models based on the high C. And here I just show you nine models of segment number three. I, we build thousands of them. And because we also have the density map of segment number three, we ask ourselves, do any of these models, which are average picture, you know that uh, high C is based on millions of cells or, or million cells or hundreds of thousands of cells. So this is an average picture. Do any of these individual models that we generate, the ensemble of models fit nicely inside the map? And this is what this plot tells you. This is a measure of how nice the model fits inside of the density map of the under the microscope, which is single base by definition. So we have uh, two uh, curves. Basically, some of the models fit nicely. Some others don't fit that nicely, but there are a few of them that fit very nicely. So for example, this one here fits quite nicely into the segmentation based under the microscope, the density map that we obtained under the microscope. So we then go ahead and take this um, model and refine it based on the actual density of the map to get a final model that fits very nicely and still maintains most of the characteristics of the high C map. So we don't only try to fit to the uh, density map, but also try to maintain the restraints that we observe in the high C, which are population based. And these are uh, a map that tells you that even though we increase the fitting, the clashes and the, and the agreement with the high C is maintained quite okay in the map. So, we can do that for all the methods. And by doing this for all, all the segments, by doing this for all the segments, what we have now is a higher resolution path of the chromatin within the segment of this particular cell. And by that then, we, because these, these models are 10 kb resolution, then we can start mapping things into those. So we have done that for the entire um, walk of these nine segments. And this is now the walk of the nine segments under the microscopy data for one cell. We can do that for all the cells. And this is how it looks now. And basically this allows us to do the following, which is we can map now a B compartment as we did before, but now we're based on high C. But not only that, we can start mapping in three dimensional what happens to any particular signature that you have in the sequence level, in this case, K4, monomethylation, and because we have the path inside, we can say, well, these 10 KB that are highly K4 monomethylated are right here in the path. And you can start seeing in 3D patches of these uh, marks now in a, Spain, in a space that you could not see before. As I mentioned to you, this is a very cool technology we can now go high resolution in few cells, but it's quite cumbersome to do. It takes quite a bit number of hours under the microscope, and it takes a lot of computational space and a lot of computational CPU. So the next step was to, can we develop something, again with the wool app, that allows us to go faster into this acquisition of the data? And here is where oligophysic comes into place. This is the work of several people in, in the lab, Hui and Shamantanu, and the work of David in our lab, again, in collaboration with the lab in this case. So what is oligophysic? As I mentioned to you, here is number of cells that you can do versus number of targets of cells. And normally in fish, and Lane has shown some beautiful images where you can do a handful number of points at the same time and you can look at distance between these points, quite powerful. You can do a large number of cells, but a relatively limited number of, of, of loci that you can look at that, at the same time. With oligostorm, we can do uh, a bit more targets per cell, but again, the number of cells that you can do is very little. You can do as many targets as you want to do the genomic walking, and I didn't mention to you, you can go down to tens of kilobases and do 
tsunami walking and people such as uh, Boetiger and friends have done beautiful work with Orca and Marcelo has done with his high C, high CM, or high M, sorry, um, have done beautiful work as well in walking chromosomes at higher resolution. Um, but then oligophysic goes into that upper corner here because with oligophysic you can do a very large number of targets per cell, theoretically thousands of targets per cell. And I say theoretically, we, we're trying to prove that this is also true uh, in practice and large number of cells, how it works. Again, we have oligos here that we use uh, on a particular region of interest. Again, genome homology, but now the bridges are a bit more complicated because they are designed in a way that then you, you can actually sequence those bridges under the microscope. And that's the in situ sequencing part of, of the experiment. That's why it's called oligophysic. So those bridges go into a particular region. So those, those oligos go into a particular regions. You can have from tens to kilobases to megabases of, of size, a minimum few to hundreds of oligos per target. So each one of the regions that you want to visualize has to have hundreds of oligos at least. And for now, we, we propose to have about a megabase separation between the targets to be able to differentiate the signal under the microscope. Again, this is wide field, it's not super resolution. That's why you can go larger number of cells in, in, in shorter time period time. Oligophysic works in three different types of chemistry. So that it can be adapted to many different types of chemistry with a very good uh, percentage of recovery of the signal in all these three, for example, three different target uh, ways of sequencing, uh, which is ligation-based, synthesis-based, or hybridization-based of sequencing. I'm not gonna go into details there. But regardless of what type of, of uh, sequencing you're gonna be using to see the um, blinking or, or the signal under the microscope, the advantage really of oligophysic is at the moment you are sequencing by rounds uh, your oligos, uh, the barcode in sequencing allows you to look at a large number of sites at the same time. So in sequential hybridization, what you will have is one signal per each one of the targets, depending on the number of colors. So basically F is the number of fluorophores and N is the number of rounds, and that grows linearly. However, at the moment you do sequential sequencing here, the number of targets you can have grows exponential with the number of rounds that you do. So is the number of colors that you use in, under the microscope to the exponential of the number of rounds that you have used in the step. Which means that in theory, if this is the number of rounds of sequencing you do under the microscope, and this is the number of targets that you wanna capture, you could have the fly genome with about between four and five rounds at about 500 kb resolution. So basically you would see every, now every 500 kb resolution, you could see an entire fly genome under the microscope with about four to five rounds of sequencing and the human genome with about seven to eight rounds of sequencing with four colors. So really explodes and that's a possibility, however, looking at 6,000 points under the microscope, and many of you know better than me, uh, is not trivial to differentiate the signal in white field. So we're working on making this a bit more uh, powerful, and this is the work of the bit as we expand this, this working. Well, let me show you some examples. This is a 46, uh, sorry, 36 plex, we call it 36 plex uh, study where we had six chromosome, and, and this is human six chromosomes where we visualize six positions in each one of the six chromosomes. We have 36 sites at the same time. And the design was done in a way totally unbiased, but we wanted to see the beginning of the chromosome, the middle of the arm, and close to the center mirror uh, end of the arm, let's say, and then the beginning of the next arm, middle of the arm, and the end of the, of the uh, right arm in, this, in each one of the cases. And this is the design that was done here with an average 600 kilobases to one megabase per target and, and 5,000 oligos per target. We have gone down to 1,000 oligos per target. It works nicely as well. Oligos are expensive to buy, so you have to be, uh, make it as cheap as possible. And in, they are between seven and, seven, seven and uh, 70 uh, megabases between the targets. 
So how it looks under the microscope. These are the images under the microscope. Uh, you have as a column, the four colors. And then as rows, you have the rounds of sequencing. And let's focus in this particular cell where we merge all the colors. And let's focus in this particular point here, uh, highlighted here. So this particular point here, after aligning all the images, and this is something that David has been working as well a lot because it's not trivial to align these images and it, they need to be aligned very well. The first color is, is purple, then it's green, then it's green in the third round and purple in the fourth round. Because we designed the oligos to have a certain barcoding of colors, we know that the only barcoding of the 36 that is purple, green, green, purple is exactly this one here. So this is the middle of the right arm of chromosome number five in our images. Now you can do this for all of them. And this is how we represent them fakely. This, these are the four rounds and we fake these towers. And this is all the images for one cell, another cell, another cell. So we are bare coding each one of the bars and then looking at what each one of these bars corresponds to. And by doing this, then we can actually identify which parts of these images corresponds to each one of the chromosomes. And here you can see, for example, chromosome two, the four, uh, the six points of chromosome two in these images. We have implemented something that we call every pixel matter in this. So we, we decode each one of the barcodes per pixel. Otherwise it would have been a bit more complicated. We have tried several other ways of, of decoding. And then we merge the pixels by the barcoding into patches. And you can see here, for example, that this patch here, and specifically it corresponds to 2KR2, again, the middle of the right arm in chromosome two. How it looks like uh, uh, in reality, this is in 3D. These are PGP1 cells, fibroblast a bit flat, but the microscope allows us to do Z stacking as well. So this is really in 3D. Um, we are decoding these images in 3D actually. And then we use our modeling platform to build a tracing so that we find the optimal path that crosses all these um, barcodes that we have identified in the images. Now, this is not trivial. It looks trivial in some images. And for some images, it's very trivial. But for some others, we have detections that are not perfect. So identifying which one belongs to which one is not trivial. So we have developed a, a computational pipeline that allows to do this tracing automatically. So here you have one entire trace of one cell. And this is how it looks like in one cell, all the six chromosomes now here being traced. Can we trace all the chromosomes equally? No, sometimes some parts of chromosomes are not traced perfectly. And this is the frequency efficiency of, of detection of the barcode for each one of these uh, different 36 plaques. We can go further than that. Uh, we can do 46 plaques, for example, in chromosome X. And this is again, the efficiency of, of the, the coding, the barcodes of each one of these positions. But this is an, a, a very much dense uh, images here. You can see actual images and here is the tracing at the very end. This is done with five rounds of sequencing about half a kilo base per probes and about 2000 oligo, oligo paints per probes and two megabase uh, between the low size. So it's a much more dense and it's a proof that this can be done with much denser um, images. Now, how long it took to do this? Two days of image acquisition, you can get about a thousand cells. That's back then, now we, we, we can do that much better about 5,000 complete chromosomes, and then you can start doing a bit of analysis on the chromosomes. What else you can do beyond chromosome tracing? I have told you before that we can do oligostorm, which is a very high resolution, but at the same time, walking is very cumbersome. You can, for looking at nine segments, we had to do nine walks and, and nine rounds of, of oligostorm uh, imaging. But what if we take the nine rounds at all at once? It takes about two hours per round. So all at once, only one round. We still don't know of all of this high resolution imaging, 
which segment belongs to what segment, what part of the chromosome is. We, we know we, which parts are we, we're looking at, but we don't know whether that's the beginning or that's the end of the chromosome that we are working. But we can take exactly the same images or, this, or the same plate where we have the cells and now do oligophysic with two rounds in about three hours per round and start decoding now each one of the points in, in white field. Because we have decoded each one of the points and we know the center of mass of each one of these images, then we can go back to the oligostorm and assign them to which part we have looked at. And we're working to make this fully automatic in the lab. Hopefully soon we will have a pipeline that can do this fully automatic. So basically with oligophysic plus oligostorm, now you can do a high resolution work of chromosomes in, in a relatively short period of time uh, and relatively cheaper, much cheaper than it was uh, otherwise. What else you can do? You can, you can look at specific sites. So we've seen the images from Eileen that she's looking for some sites. And now she was looking for three, four sites at the same time. Now you can do tens of sites at the same time. And here we show an oligophysic um, multiple loci detection, a specific, a specific loci. You can also do protein immunofluorescence at the same time that you do uh, the tracing of chromosome. And here you have, with, with the same images, you have protein localization of some of the proteins of interest plus the tracing of the chromosomes. So uh, we believe that oligophysic allows you to do a lot of the things that you guys are really looking for doing uh, in your labs. So oligophysic and oligostorm is a set of technologies for in vitro sequencing mapping with, uh, we believe are highly versatile. It, it allows us to identify in relatively uh, short time and relatively cheap um, with wide field microscopy, uh, thousands of cells and identify subcluster of specific or conformational characteristics. I have not shown any of this, but it's in the paper if you are interested and can be, as I mentioned, pipeline and we're working to make it work I blind in with oligostorm. So let me finish this, this talk by acknowledging who actually did the work. This is the beautiful people in, in, in our group that they do all the work that I have mentioned to you, but today specifically, David and Irene are, so this is David and this is Irene, are the people behind oligophysic and oligostorm respectively our part. But of course, this is all done in, with a close collaboration with uh, the WULAP, and we have recently uh, been funded by the NIH to bring these technologies to the next level. So hopefully over the next five years uh, in something that we call the Center for uh, Genome Imaging, um, where we have also Nicola Neretti and Edith Lieberman-Naden, hopefully we will bring these technologies further and you are, we will be more than happy to talk to you about what we're doing in this Center for Genome Imaging. So thank you very much. Uh, open for questions now.